So uh, today we're going to continue. So much like last week, I had this teaching, and it was great. I had this teaching, and then last week it all changed in the middle of the night, right? And I scribbled out my notes, and then it was like, oh, this is great because now I already have one for next week. This is fantastic. I'll just keep mulling that over. I'm already prepared. And then I felt like again yesterday, it gave me a little more time, but I feel like he wanted me to stay on this topic of fathers through just some things that I had read through the week, um, some things that I had listened to, um, praying about it, looking at the word, just conversation I was having with him. <clears throat> so yesterday I ro- wrote out a whole new set of notes. So we are, we are doing this together right? So we are learning this at the same time. I am not 10 steps ahead. We are literally like, I've just wrote these notes down yesterday. So I am still processing, and, um, but I think it's important. It's been important to me. And um, so I want to talk to you today about a father's heart. I want to continue talking about that. Last week, we talked about things fathers do, and I'll, I'll, re- I'll touch, back, touch back on that again as we go, but a father's heart. So let's look at a couple verses. We're going to look at first Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so Jesus, you know, a lot of people, sometimes when I read books, I get frustrating because they make um, these very like specific statements. Like G- Jesus had one mission when he came to earth, right? And I'm like, I don't know. If we all read the Bible, kind of, we're all going to express that one mission a little differently, right? There's so many inside one mission. He accomplished so many things. Does that make sense? And so, but one of the things, and maybe the primary thing, mixed in with all the other things he did, was Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. So, some examples of that. Ephesians 2, verse 16. uh, It says, and that he might reconcile them both. So, he's, he's reconciling not only... We're going to see people to the Father, but he's reconciling us to each other. So in Ephesians, he's talking to Jews and Gentiles. He's talking to those in the inner courts and the outer courts in the temple system, some that were not of a specific lineage who could not enter into the inner courts, right? Jesus came to unite both of them, which was the giant shocker news of the day, that he might reconcile them both in one body to God uh, through the cross by it having put to death the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, through Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So through Jesus, we have been reconciled to the Father. This access point has been opened, and now we all have access to him. Access is a reconciling word to the Father. Look at Colossians 1, uh, verse 19. Colossians 1, so it's, it's right there, um, not too many pages away. So verse 19, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Speaking of Jesus, remember that part, we'll come back to it. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And although you, us, were previously alienated, hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, He has now reconciled you in His body of flesh through death in order to present you before him, this is access again, present you before him, holy and blameless beyond reproach. Uh, Let's look at one more, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, so we're we're picking up on all this reconciling access us to the Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... This person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things, um, behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their wrongdoings against them. Uh, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So again, we see God moving with action to reconcile us to himself. The word says it was his good pleasure. He took delight in that. He has joy in that. He has emotion tied to that. It was his good pleasure to, to give us access to him, to bring us near to him again. Um, and then also in this last passage, we begin to see in, in that same vein, we are now commissioned with the same ministry of reconciliation ourselves, just like our father. So <clears throat> with all of that, we can look back at the word. Uh, we can look back in Genesis chapter one, and we can see that the enemy has an agenda of trying to uh, discredit the father. He is trying to do the opposite of reconciling us to the Father. His goal is distance and disconnection with the Father. That's his agenda. That's what he's trying to do. And we see it as clear as, I mean, thinking about this last night. I mean, it's just we talk about the enemy showing his hand, right? Things get so extreme and obvious. You know, it's just like there's not a lot of subtlety sometimes in his attacks anymore, his messages, the lies that he broadcasts in the atmosphere. Um, his agenda is trying to discredit the father. To discredit the father is trying to distrust, distrust the father. So we see it in the garden. We see, um, um, did God really say, you can't, surely he didn't say that. Let me take what he said and just add a couple nuggets to it. So it sounds like what he said, but not really. Um, is he really someone you can trust? This is what the enemy is doing with Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, so um, if you can, <clears throat> uh, let me just walk through some of my notes. I scribbled some of these down and we'll wrap this all up at the end. Nice little bow. It's going to be really great. It's going to look really pretty. My wife is the ultimate rapper. She will get Christmas. It's like the living room's full of stuff, right? You have to like, to get to the couch, you're like over the rolls of paper, the bows. Somehow in all of that comes this amazing like sparkle, glitter, bows. Not just any bow. I'm like one bow. I got one bow I can tie. She has multiple bows that she can tie. Very skilled. <clears throat> so, so I'm going to attempt to do the same with my teaching. So hang in there. I'm going to try try wrap this up with some multiple bows at the end. So... Um, if you can distrust the Father, you can discredit all authority. If you can distrust the Father, you can discredit all authority. We see this in our relationship with the Father. The enemy is trying to get you to distrust the Father so you can discredit his authority over your life. Authority is a big word and sometimes a scary word because people have been authoritatively very scary. But we're going to talk some more about authority and how the Father, the heart of the Father, His authority. You see, you can see it in households. I didn't. I haven't had an experience like that. I have. I have my dad here today. My, I'm 40. My parents are still showing up to all the things that I do. <laughs> right. Very good. Right. They show if I joined a Parks and Rec basketball league. I think they might show up. Right. They're still showing up. So I obviously have very trustworthy, supportive, amazing examples, life-giving parents in my life, right? And then uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 years ago, married my wife, and it came along with another set of parents, um, and she would have the same, the same thing. And for 14 years, I have, ha I have, have, the, same, I have say the same thing. I have two sets of parents, and I know not everybody has that, and that sometimes that... Um, that can be, uh, I'm very hurtful, I, I, I get it, but if you can distrust the, f discredit the, distrust the Father, you can discredit all authority. We see it in our relationship with the Father in heaven and in our homes. The enemy's trying to discredit the fathers in homes. If you can discredit the fathers in the home, you lose, a th you, can, you can begin to, um, if you could distrust fathers in the home, you could begin to discredit authority. And, and I think, even though I haven't had that experience, uh, even having, having other friends, you, you, can see, you can see homes 
where a father is distrusted and authority is gone and, and children act, um, live a life without submission to good, godly authority. Are you with me? Okay. If you could distrust the father, you can discredit all authority. Heaven's authority works with trust. It operates off trust. So if you can destroy trust, then you cannot exchange truth. This is a little bit from a podcast. I was listening to Danny Silk, so I'm walking through his, his steps here. If you can destroy trust, then you cannot exchange truth. If you can't exchange truth, everyone is in survival mode all the time. Everyone's trying to look a certain way to get a certain something. And then he quotes someone named Thomas um, Sawell, uh, I think an, an economist. I had to look him up. I don't know. Solwell. Solwell, right. Um, a lot of amazing quotes. He, so he has a quote, if I can, if I want to help you, I tell you the truth. If I want something from you, I tell you what I want, what you want to hear. So when I'm listening to Danny Silk talk about this, he talks about if you could destroy trust, then you can't exchange truth. In our society, the exchange of truth is like crazy town right now. It's insane. All over the place. Between, you know, you think it's just like, oh, I can't trust. In, in the church, it's like, I don't know what to believe. How do we handle this? What do we do? Do we do this? Should I think this way? Should we? It just seems, it seems a little bonkers, you know, and you're trying to hold on. And, and so then when he says it puts everyone in survival mode, you're like, oh my gosh. Like we as a world sometimes seem like we're, we are in survival mode. It's because we've lost the ability to, to exchange truth. It's under attack because we've discredited trust in the Father. Like a lot of the things that we see aren't the problem, they're the manifestation of the problem. It's the fruit of the, the problem that's being produced. And I think, I think it goes all the way back to distrusting the Father. And so you lose authority. And then you stop the flow of everything that happens, I'm getting ahead, everything that, that happens when you submit yourself to authority, the flow that happens gets kinked off and you live with the fruit and manifestation of, of, of a different flow, of, of no authority, of distrust, of fear. Um, so when you lose trust, you destroy the essence of authority and what it's there for. Trust is the exchange of truth. So in relationships, this looks like um, being able to tell someone, if I am able to tell, if I'm able to tell my wife or anyone I'm in relationship with how I'm feeling, how I'm experiencing you, or how I'm experiencing the situation, then, then I'm trusting you. Does that make sense? When I can't do that, it's because there's distrust. If we're in a relationship and I'm not being honest and being able to say, um, you know, or even it's how we teach our kids, right? You need to, you need to be able to say, when you do this, it made me feel this way, right? This, some one, there will be this dis, this um, this uh, justice issue, right? One of the kids runs in the house. Oh my gosh, Evelyn did this to me, bah! You know, and it's like you need to go tell her when you did this, it made me feel like this, right? Because trust and connection is at stake in there, and so it's important for her to be able to exchange that truth with her sister her sister to be able to have that feedback and, and in order to protect that, that trust to apologize or we often say, I'm sorry, next time I will, um, you know, it's like a little template. Like, it, w what are you going to do in the future from now on to help protect her heart, right? That's what's happened. That's, that's trust. Trust is the exchange of truth. If I can't tell you how I'm experiencing you or what, we, uh, what I need from you, how I'm experiencing the situation, if I can tell you those things, I trust you. It's a vulnerability. The enemy tries um, to destroy trust and disrupt that exchange of truth back and forth. He's trying to destroy that. So fathers have, um, fathers have become, like in, in the world and society, fathers oftentimes have become a joke, right? They have become... Literally, if you're looking in media shows, the fathers can be the fumbling, bumbling one. Um, 
oftentimes they maybe they just stumble upon something the right way, you know, or it's it's really everybody else in the house getting it together, and the father's like, "Wow, I did that," you know, and everybody else is in the background going, "Sure, dad," you know. Um, there, there, that happens a lot of times in movies. It happens a lot of times in shows. Um, I got this. So, caveat. Let me just disclaimer this. My kids gave the best Father's Day cards this year of all time, right? It was by far the best. Super cute, picked them out on their own. Um, and so, but one of the cards kind of to have this example, but don't tell my kids, um, <laughs> illustrates it a little bit. Still super cute though, right? Still super cute. I have no problem with the card. It's still on my desk. But it's doing the whole thing. Dad, you've done such a great job. You deserve blah, 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 blah. You, here's this pen. You have earned the boss, right? So it's this pin that says the boss, you know, and then you open up the card and it says, be sure to give it back to mom tomorrow, you know? <laughs> and so it's funny, right? But you see little subtle, subtle message of you're kind of the boss, but you're not really the boss, dad, kind of really. And by, uh, by no means, my eight-year-old has this intention in her heart, right? She just probably really loved the pin. She still has the pin. <laughs> she has the boss pin. And so, super cute, but it just got me thinking about it. Still have the card, love the card. Do you understand my heart there? Sorry, I feel so bad. I'm not trying to call, call it out. But it was just such a little tiny example, you know. And um, so, so, father's authority oftentimes is a mockery. Um, and the reason this happens, it, and I, I think you see the fruit of it. I don't know if it's really the intention, but it's, I think it's the motivation and the spirit is to uh, create distance, right? It's to detach the son from the father. It's to, if I can get you to distrust the father, if I can make the father a joke, if I can make you think of, um, of him in a certain way, I can begin to detach the son from the father, the daughter from the father, the mom from the father. I can detach the father from society because of the, the messaging around the father. And then if we're not trusting the father, we're not going to live in authority to a father. If we can discredit the father or even villainize the father, then it follows that all, it would follow. So if we can do that to the father, then it would also begin to be true that all who want to be connected to that father can also be discredited or villainized. If we can believe that the father is a villain and untrustworthy, and then we see someone that wants to be connected to that father, it would follow that we can also discredit, distrust them, and see them as a villain. Are you with me? You see some of that. So when I think about this, you can begin to see some of the outworkings of this, like in the very things that we're living in right now. Distance, disconnection. Everyone begins to shrink away. In the Old Testament culture, you have this patriarchal society, right? This patriarchal culture where things flow from the father to the son. And you see it. You just start in Genesis. You see it over and over and over and over again. You see it, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You see um, authority, blessing, prosperity, benefit all flow from the father to the son. There's, there's a flow in that relationship of these things. Inheritance, there's a flow from the father to the son. Um, you see it in Jesus' life. We talked about this last week a little bit. You see Jesus saying, um, kind of along the same lines, I only do what I see the father doing. There's this flow in this relationship between the son and the father. The son saying, it is, um, uh, it is my, I think, how does he say it? I think I, uh, it, is, it is my bread to do the father's will. You see Jesus say that. You see Jesus say, um, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? This is all kind of hearkening back to this relationship between the father and the son. Um, so all that Jesus, so if we look at that and we see that, we begin to see that all that, all that flowed into Jesus' life, all that Jesus had to give away, he got through the strength of this union with his father. All that flowed into his life and flowed out of his life, all that Jesus had to give away, all that he released, all that he commissioned, all that he poured into, all that he did 
came through this flow of a father to a son, through this connection, this union that Jesus had with his father. We see this, um, we see this challenged in the wilderness. So we see Jesus get baptized. The father declares over his son identity, purpose, love. He declares it over him. The Holy Spirit descends upon him, and he, he's led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. And the temptation of the enemy was to distrust his father, to attack that very connection. If I can have you distrust that father, I can remove his authority over your life. I can get you to exchange authority. You see that? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to now, instead of give him father, I'm going to give you father. I'm going to give the father of lies authority. Instead of giving, giving you authority over my life, he's trying to yield, ha, yield your submission and authority to the father of lies. So he appeals to Jesus to exchange his trust and disrupt the flow of all those things pouring into his life. Jesus' response is, I will fight for connection and union with my father. That's Jesus' response each time. Right? He references the word. No, it says this. He stands and he fights for this connection with his father. I think this is super important for us today. Right? I think this is where so much of our battle is. It is f us fighting to stay connected with our Father, living in submission to Him, experiencing that flow from a father to a child. And I, I believe it's under attack, under attack today, have, has been, obviously, since, since the Garden of Eden. Um, let me see here. Uh, so a couple other things. Let's jump through this part real quick. So Ephesians 5.23 and Colossians 1.18, these are kind of headship verses. It talks about how Jesus is the head of the church. Um, it talks about the husband being the head of the wife. It talks about submission, right? Um, I'm sure as a church, we haven't always nailed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no expert. I haven't, I haven't dove, is it dove? I haven't dove into that passage yet. Um, really to unpack it, and so I'm not even going to really wade in there. But um, so you see, you see this word head. You see this uh, teaching of headship. So headship, I heard it explained to me this way this week. Headship is really um, kind of like source. Uh, what else did I write down? Um, source or headwaters. So if you think of... Um, these deltas that pour into the ocean, right? In Sacramento, or I don't what's around here? I don't know what's right here. Some, I don't know if the Los, is Los Angeles River pouring into the ocean. I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, okay. So, uh, but, but Sacramento, right? We were kind of up in and around the Sacramento River uh, last year for vacation. And this is, by the time it's getting to the ocean, it's this giant thing, right? But if you go to the source, it begins in this mountain as a, as a trickle, as a stream. That's really its source. It's not necessarily this dominating force that's raging into the ocean by the end, okay? So when we're talking about headship, we're talking about source. We're talking about headwaters. It is, um, it is, it's not, here's the big thing. It's not, headship is not a roof. It's not a roof saying, you cannot get past here because I'm here in authority. Headship is a launching pad. I drew a picture of a little square and a rocket. Headship is launching pad. Authority is authorization. Here's a flow. So you're going to have authority. You're going to draw a little arrow in your notes. Authorization. There is a flow from healthy authority. Healthy authority flows into authorization, freedom, release. Unhealthy authority flows into oppression, destruction, dominating. You see that? Healthy authority flows into authorization. It's not control. So in a family, when I'm thinking about me as a father and my kids, if I'm going to be the head of the family, it's not for the sake of oppression. It's not for the sake of controlling you to do what I think you need to do. 
and to make sure you do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to be punished. It's not that. It, it is authorization to my children. My goal as a headship is to raise them up and train them to become uh, and release them, equip them to be ma- mature sons and daughters. There's a difference there. Rather than being a, a roof in the sake of, of, of a, like uh, being completely over them and not um, allowing them, gosh, I don't know how to say it. Maybe I should just not say it. Um, so fathers to sons, not control, but raising mature sons and daughters. So we see this a lot. I see this in my life. Not a lot. Hopefully not a lot. So, but we probably all see this in our life with our most important relationships, right? So for me, it's going to be my wife, my kids. And so on my worst moments, how many of you have worst moments? So I'm not alone. I have some worst moments and hopefully it's not every moment. How many of you are in process, right? And so we're working these things out to become more Christ-like. We're not going to work them out very well if we distrust the Father. We're not submitted to his authority. We're not going to see the flow of those things that shape us more and more into Christ in that area and help us along in this process. And so, but we can all do that. If we allow that to become our internal culture, we're going to create that outside of us. It's going to happen. It's going to become the culture of the home. The more I let that fester and just become my internal culture, it's going to flow outside and it's going to attempt to be the culture of the home. Um, if I do that, I'm showing my kids uh, that I will use my authority to control rather than to train and empower, rather than to authorize them. Okay, holy moly. Here we go. Let's wrap this up. So one of the things we have to do is we have to understand that there has to be authority. There has to be healthy authority. I'm going to read through my notes here fairly quick, okay? Um, We have to realize that there is a flow from heaven to earth. We see this in the word of God through relationships. We see this from God to man. We see this from man to the earth. Um, We see this, um, honor your fathers and mothers. There's a flow in that relationship. Comes with a promise. A lot of these things are, uh, do your relationships in this way and you'll see this flow in you and through you. Honor your fathers and mothers. Honor your wives. So uh, here we go. We go back to Ephesians 5, right? It's, it's husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. There's a flow in that relationship. Um, it's wives um, respect your husbands. The Bible speaks submit to one another. There, there, is, there is a flow. There is a recognition of, of submission with one another and honoring that God has built that into to the, the fabric of humanity. Our society is trying to get us, is trying to get kids, little culture today, the message of the enemy is trying to get little kids to distrust, even at the youngest age, things as simple as um, your name and what you should be called, even though mothers and fathers have declared a name over you. The enemy is trying to say that name was a mistake. You can't distrust them. You can't trust the ones who named you and know who you are from birth. And if I can get you to do that from, it seems like, younger and younger, I can get you to to distrust their authority, and I can detach you from the Father. If I can can start doing that, I can even, if we think about Roe v. Wade, like the biggest attack, right, on on the little ones, because they didn't even get a chance to hear it, but the the parents in them is that I'm trying to distrust the father, get you to distrust the father that he has value and declared value for this life. If I can get you to distrust the father's heart, um, distrust the father for the value of that child in the womb, I can strip away his authority from that. And you, you, you don't, you don't have to live under that authority. You see, you see just some of the little manipulations of distrusting the Father. Just seems so, I don't know, just seems so powerful. Like, it just what a, I mean, if you're going to look at it, what, what a strategy. And so our strategy is to, to trust the Father again, to teach generations to trust the Father again. 
to protect our connection with him and each other, to protect this exchange of truth so we can, in our family, and we have to do it in our families. It has to start in our families, right? Because overturning Roe v. Wade or changing policy in schools, it's just, part, it's just part of the thing. If we're doing that, but we're not living in trust with our fathers and family and right relationship, the world's going to see right through it. It's just going to see right through it. There, and there will not be authority. There will not be inheritance flowing from the Father through that situation. And it's all good to fight for, but we have to go the next thing. We have to, you know, we have to start finding out where, um, you know, these, these, uh, Christ, you know, these crisis pregnancy centers are. We have to begin to invest in them. We have to think about the adoption system. And, and it has, I'm sure it can get better. I don't know anything about it, but I'm sure I know it can get better. And, and to think about how that's us submitting to the Father and walking out in connection with these ones rather than just fight for their life as a legal declaration or a law of the land, which has to come. We come to you in submission. We come to you acknowledging you as our source and our headship. We come to you yield, with yielded hearts saying, God, I only want to do what I see you do. It's, it's, it is my bread to do the will of the Father. We thank you, God, that your authority is one of authorization, of love and release and life. And so we say, Holy Spirit, would you just come in our hearts and um, just begin to soften our hearts that we could yield it to the Father. Thank you for the access we have to your heart. And we just declare over ourselves, over our nation, Father, that you are restoring the Father's heart, that you are on the move to reveal the Father from the littlest ones um, to, those, um, to those still in the womb all the way to the oldest ones. You are revealing the heart of the Father. We say yes to that. We yield our lives to you. Shape us, mold us, make us, God, so that we can allow your fullness, your life, your, um, your blessing um, to flow into us and out of us. So we love you. We thank you for being a good, good father. In Jesus' name. Amen, church? Amen. Amen.